This Week in the NBA is a presentation of CNN Sports Illustrated. Coming up on This Week in the NBA, all the action from Sunday's playoff games, including the pesky Nets sticking around against the Bulls once again. Plus, a story on the Lakers. Good enough? Yes. But mature enough to go all the way? I have no patience whatsoever. I hate patience. I hate waiting. Back East, shades of 1970 at Madison Square Garden. Could a Willis Reed type scene be played out by the next current superstar with a return sooner than expected? We'll answer all the questions, so get comfy and fix yourself a bite to eat. If I go to the store and buy a sandwich and ladies say we ain't got no lettuce, I don't want the sandwich. Wow, kind of makes me hungry. Hi again, everybody. Welcome to This Week in the NBA. I'm Barry LeBrock. And I'm Michael Onis. Great time of year. NBA playoffs in full swing. And we start with a team that should still be kicking it in June, the Bulls. Yeah, absolutely. Has not been easy yet, though, for Chicago. And going into game one of their opening round playoff series, the question for the Bulls might have been whether or not the Nets would suffice simply as an adequate tune-up for the rest of the postseason. But after game one, it was more like, wow, are these guys really that good? The Nets bit and fought and scratched and clawed for 48 minutes and beyond, finally succumbing in overtime. Today, same kind of fight, same kind of effort as the Nets tried to even the series. Here we go. Game two in Chicago. Bill Wennington in the second quarter goes baseline around Ronnie Cycli. Happy birthday, Bill Wennington. It's his 35th. Pulls up by six. Kick and roll from the Nets. Jason Williams ends up with a slam from Sherman Douglas. Pulls up 37-30. Late second quarter, Lucius Harris just lets go of a brick. And here we go the other way. The Bulls on the run. They do it better than anyone. Michael Jordan to Ron Harper to Scott Burrell. And all boys get the good stuff working. Pulls up by 16 at the break. Third quarter. After Sam Cassell tried to work out some kinks, Chicago running again. Kukoc to Harper to Pippen right through the lane. Big two-handed crush. Pulls up 17. And they kept pouring it on. Later in the third, Michael coming at you. Fouled. Basket, yes, and it counts. Nothing but nothing but solid. Bulls by 20. But look out. Here come the Nets. They were down nine. Then Sherman Douglas went through the lane, cut the lead to seven. The Bulls, though, would hold on. Tony Kukoc outside, misses the three. Offensive rebound, Scott Burrell to Steve Kerr. And the long-range bomber fires away. Chicago bent but didn't break it on. Oh, guys, you got to get on Steve Kerr. The Nets go down again despite another valiant effort. 96-91 is the final. With more from Chicago, here's John Gino. With the sting of a subpar playoff opener still fresh, Phil Jackson not so subtly demanded improvement from a Chicago second unit that was outscored 31-7 by New Jersey subs in game one. On Sunday, the backup Bulls heeded Jackson's message by providing 22 pivotal points and some much needed rest for the weary Chicago veterans. It's very important because uh, we can't put all the pressure on, on the starters to score all the points. And uh, uh, New Jersey's got a lot of potency uh, coming off the bench with Gatling, uh, Cycli, Cell, he's healthy. So uh, we've got to be able to match that. Yeah. Our bench came in and gave us some good minutes. You know, Steve Kerr particularly, he came in, came in and gave us some, uh, some uh, big points. And, and Bill Whittington, you know, came in and gave us some real good minutes. And um, I, I think that's, you know, uh, the more we can keep them involved, you know, the better or well-rounded we're going to be as a team. Phil made an effort to get us in the game and involved earlier and sooner. He felt that uh, he kind of pushed the starters and the, fir the first unit a little bit uh, harder than he needed to. And uh, he, he got started making rotations with five, five minutes into the first quarter, which helped the, team, helped the bench get a rhythm and, and helped the difference. While the results of the first two games surprised no one, Chicago's propensity for bulldozing and watching double-digit leads shrink has raised some eyebrows. It happened in game one when the Nets turned a 14-point deficit into an overtime test of nerves, and it happened on Sunday when the Bulls watched a 21-point lead dwindle to three in the final 15 seconds. There's a little bit of concern. We really have to keep them all moving, but uh, we became a little bit lax on offense and didn't move the ball around enough, and defensively we became a little bit porous. Uh, Sherman Douglas took advantage of that and got drives to the basket, so we have to concentrate a little bit more on that. Changes the tempo of the game. They obviously give you opportunities to run, and uh, you have to make good choices and good decisions out of that. And uh, we've been okay 
I wouldn't say we've been good. I wouldn't say we've been bad. We've just been fair. I think we can be more focused on the road because we lose some of the distractions. You know, it's a lot of distractions when you play on. You, know, you got to worry about the traffic. You got to worry about tickets and all the family members or whatever. When you get on the road, you don't have those distractions. A victory on Wednesday in New Jersey would bode well for the Bulls, not only physically, but historically as well. In all five championship seasons, the Bulls swept their first round opponent. In Chicago, John Giannone, CNN Sports Illustrated. And now for game two between the Knicks and Heat. Pat Riley feared the letdown after Miami's game one victory. Talk about fear. P.J. Brown said it would be a nightmare for him to go back to New York with the series tied 1-1. He will live his nightmare. Look good early for the Heat. They started strong again. The Heat playing the D. Dan Marley gets the steal. That starts the break. And Vashawn Leonard on fire. 21 points in the first half. Knocks down the three here. Leonard only finished with 25. Four in the second half. Here's another three from Leonard as Miami builds the 14-point lead. But the Knicks, behind some fire from John Starks, they come back. Starks with the three ball. One more from behind the arc. Then Allen Houston with another three. He had 24. Like that, the Knicks are back in it. The outside game, they had it going. Same with the inside stuff. Larry Johnson takes it right to Alonzo Mourning. He had 22. The Knicks up two, and they are pumped. Fired up again in the fourth. Allen Houston, the steal. John Starks with the lay-in and the foul. Knicks up five. Starks again. This time, nice fake and the soft jump shot. Starks with 25. Knicks up eight. Now it's a five-point game, and it's Chris Childs with the dagger. The long three that sealed the deal. The Knicks win it. 96-86. They even the series the Knicks plenty of heroes but the key the team's resolve when they did not fold after falling behind 14. Who has seven points of the game? I guess they thought it was going to be another blowout and uh, you know the pressure kind of shifted to them and uh, you know I thought we did a good job of him. We let him off the hook obviously and we had him on the ropes in the second quarter and um, kind of exhaled. Um, exhale and relax. You can't do that against this team. I thought the key to the game was John. John gave him just tremendous energy and, you know, gave him a big, big game. And I thought that was, uh, you know, that was a big, big lift for them. Going along with that, you can see how important John Starks is to the Knicks. Pretty much non-existent in the first part of the game as the Knicks trailed by 14. But in the final 30 minutes, he scored 22, softened the Heat's defense, and keyed New York's comeback. Joining us now, our NBA insider, Brian Burwell. Brian, you were there. You know, what did the Knicks do that, that was that much different offensively in game two to free up a John Starks and Allen Houston? Now, Mike, you know, in the NBA playoffs, defense is a constant, and particularly when you're talking about the Knicks and the Heat. But what happened in this game that did not happen in game one was the Knicks found a way to open up some space for the perimeter shooters. There wasn't any of that high pick and roll stuff that just got in, in uh, Allen Houston's way. He got some room, and more important, John Starks, he admitted that emotionally he has really taken, it has taken a toll on him, some of the illnesses and the, the, the deaths in his family recently. He finally got rid of that stuff mentally, and you could see the difference, man. He was aggressive, he was getting his shots, and they're going to need John Starks' aggressiveness and his control, which we saw today, if they plan on winning this series. Yeah, there's so much a different team when John Starks is playing like that. Uh, they have the outside game going inside as well. And one of the guys doing the dirty work, the grand old man, Terry Cummings, 14 boards. How, why did he come to life? It's amazing. No minutes at all in the first game. He gets in there now, first of all, hitting those boards, he was able to trigger a lot of those transition baskets. The other thing was defensively, with Patrick out, he is the only big man in that, in that lineup now who can play post defense behind, uh, behind Alonzo and really give him some resistance. Now, let's go to some injury updates. Dan Marley, the defensive stopper for the Heat, pulled his groin muscle in the first quarter. And I talked to him after the game, and he says, I'm not really sure how well I'll be or if I'll even be available for game three. But one guy who could be available either in game three or game four, drum roll please, Patrick Ewing. We're talking about the Captain Willis Reed, that kind of drama. Now, if I were the Knicks and I knew this guy was playing and I had any sense of drama, I would get Marv Albert to be the PA announcer and send the Garden into a frenzy and at least give the Knicks an incredible home court advantage for at least one game. But all that said, I still think Miami is going to kick it up and they'll win this series. What a scene that would be. Brian, thanks very much. Uh, we'll talk to you a little bit later in the show.
imagine that, Barry. You play the Willis Reed tape, and then you shine the spotlight on Ewing coming out of the locker room. Yeah. It should be wild in New York. Reed, though, had the bad wheel, and Ewing with that wrist and, and all the time off, I don't know how effective he'd be, but certainly an emotional lift it would be for the Knicks if he could return. It's Broadway. We'll see what happens. All right, still to come, the Lakers and Blazers, game two from Los Angeles. Eddie Jones got talked down in game one. We'll see how he responded today. And what about these Lakers? Is all that talent lacking a bit of maturity to back it up? We'll explore that question coming up. And the question for the T-Wolves, how do you come back after getting blown out by 25 in game one against Seattle? We'll see if they had the answers when we come back. congratulate you on your coverage of the Muslim pilgrimage this year. It was simply magnificent and unusual. Thank you very much and congratulations once more. Europe is about to become a continent of money changes as the European Union gets ready for the launch of a single currency. Will the euro turn the continent into a trading superpower? Or will it fall victim to divisions among EU members? A series of special reports and select editions of Insight and Q&A with Riz Khan examine the issues behind European Monetary Union. Money Talks, Europe's single currency. Throughout the day on CNN. Well, a whole lot of smack being talked by the Portland Trailblazers before their series with the Lakers. Isaiah Ryder specifically dogging Eddie Jones. Sometimes trash talking Lakers being beaten at their own game. But the more important game, the opener on the court did go to L.A. Game two, Jones stepping up and the Lakers stepping toward a two-love lead. This one also at the Forum. Here we go, Isaiah Ryder and Eddie Jones, the two guys in question, getting together before the game in midcourt. Second quarter, Blazers up by five and Jones is working on Ryder. How about straight to the baseline and the right-hander? A little kiss off the window. Lakers by two at halftime. Third quarter, Ryder caught in the screen. Steady Eddie, always ready to let go of the three. Does so there. Later third quarter, Lakers by nine. Ori to O'Neal down low. How are you going to stop that? The big diesel working it. 80-69 Lakers. And then Nick Van Exel off the screen. Robert Ori takes the pass, beats the three, takes the three to beat the buzzer. Lakers lead 89-72. They start to pull away, turning the defense into offense. Kobe Bryant to Van Exel, and oh boys, that's the way you work it. Lakers up 96-82, and then more Lakers later. Ori, the nice pass to Shaq. Get out of my way. Jones flexed his muscles for 21. Rick Fox at a team high 24, and the Lakers win it again. 108-99 is the final. The big difference here came in the third quarter for Los Angeles. The Lakers outscored them 35 to 23 in the quarter. They hit 12 of 15 field goal attempts, also deadly from behind the arc. Robert Ory was the go-to guy. Two love Lakers. Now it's on to Portland for Game Three on Tuesday. So the Lakers are on the verge of advancing to the second round of the playoffs. That's where they were knocked out by the Jazz a year ago. Have they improved since? How many question their talent with four All-Stars? The questions lie within the head and the heart. Our Tom Rinaldi does some exploratory surgery. If experience is the name we give to our mistakes, 
then the Lakers already might have all the postseason wisdom they need. And the Utah Jazz going to the Western Conference Finals. Let's just hope that we are better through our experience and more determined through our failures, and that's been the history of good teams in the league. The Lakers are good, no question. Good enough to win 61 games. Good enough to win 22 of their last 25. But in this postseason, the question is, are the Lakers better? For all the Lakers' momentum, there remains the question of their maturity. The Lakers are the fourth youngest team in the NBA, almost five years younger on average than Utah and Seattle. If failure was the best teacher for the Jazz and the Sonics, have the young Lakers learned enough lessons of their own? In a lot of ways, I don't think a lot of our guys have had a whole lot of failure. And, uh, and as we go forward now to the playoffs, this is, a, this is a testing ground night in and night out to show how, how, how much we've improved maturity-wise and also skill-wise. You can call this Laker team a lot of things. One thing you can't call them is old. People say with old age comes wisdom, but with youth comes passion. But what about the space between those two things, what we like to call patience? I have no patience whatsoever. I hate patience. I hate waiting. You know, if I go to the store and buy a sandwich and the lady say we ain't got no lettuce, I don't want the sandwich. I don't want to wait for the lettuce. I want everything right now. This is training camp basketball. This is not what I'm basketball. In the postseason, the flow slows and the pace putters. For all the showtime of the Lakers' offense, ranked first in scoring and margin of victory, they were last in the more patient practice of free throw shooting, crucial in the playoffs. There are questions on defense, too, where Eddie Jones stands alone as a premier defender. I think the last 25, 30 games, we've showed that we can play defense. We, we've been holding everybody down from, from 40, 43% and lower. And, uh, I think we can do it defensively, and uh, playoffs is, is, is going to be the place where we show everybody we can do that. The playoffs will also be the place to show if experience's edge is exaggerated and if youth will indeed be served. I think you just have to make up with it with desire and hunger. Uh, you know, you're not going to learn what Utah knows overnight. I mean, they've accumulated that year after year after year. But it's important for us to want it more. And when you want something more, sometimes that can make up for what you don't know. Sounds like something a young man and a young team would say. In Los Angeles, Tom Rinaldi, CNN Sports Illustrated. Coming up, more playoff action. The T-Wolves and Sonics take it down to the wire. And we go inside the game with our Brian Burwell and revisit an old topic. What's in the future for Mitch Richmond and Ike Austin? One is staying, one is going. Brian coming back with the answers after a break. <laughs> the official beer of World Cup 98. We would miss it for the world. Official partner of World Cup 98, Bud. We never thought our village would get connected. We are so poor and so far away. But we worked hard to make it happen. And so did CARE. Now this new technology will help improve our lives in our own village. There are still places to reach and people to help. Make the connection. Care. How many lives can you change today? Israel is celebrating 50 years of existence, five decades marked by war and an uneasy peace with its Arab neighbors. In CNN's special coverage of this anniversary, our correspondents across the region trace Israel's history, from its painful birth to the modern state, its relations with the Arabs within and beyond its borders. Join Jerusalem Bureau Chief Walter Rogers for a special half hour, Israel at 50, only on CNN.
Timberwolves trying to bounce back from the whoop and put, them on, put on them by the Sonics in game one. Minnesota's Kevin Garnett picked up his fourth foul early in third, but it didn't affect his game. Gary Payton drives, and Garnett says, take that garbage to the dump. The big rejection there. Stephon Marbury getting in on it with the shot clock winding down. Little sweetness from the baseline falling out of bounds. And then Gary Payton responds. Watch the fake pick and roll. And then straight to the hole. Off the window with the reverse right there. But Marbury would answer step for step with Payton. Blows past Greg Anthony. The guy is so quick and so elusive and so strong to the hoop. Minnesota up 77-71 after three. Fourth quarter. Timberwolves hustling. Terry Porter the save. Anthony Peeler. We'll get it back to Porter, straight to the hole. Wolves up 84-80. Seattle working the ball around the perimeter, trying to catch up. This will help you in a hurry. Peyton Bingo with the three-pointer. Timberwolves lead cut to one. But down the stretch, the young kids held tough. Michael Williams has the open three, but he saw Kevin Garnett's man down on the floor with an injury. And it is a winner for Minnesota, a winner in Seattle. 98-93 over the Sonics. Well, we take a quick break from the playoffs, check some other news from around the league, and our go-to guy in this offense, our insider, Brian Burwell. Brian, welcome back. Let's talk some coaching news, and what's the latest with interim coach Alvin Gentry in Detroit? Well, Alvin is scheduled to have a meeting with Bill Davidson, the Pistons owner, tomorrow. And it's really a formality because he will be named the permanent coach either on Tuesday or Wednesday. Now, talking about other coaching changes, the Clippers on the top of their wish list are, of course, Phil Jackson and George Carl. Now, everybody must be wondering why in the world would they want to leave the top of the mountain to go to the bottom of the valley? Very simple. It's for total control, the kind of control they cannot get where they are right now. Now, other names that are on the Clippers list include Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, Paul Westfall, Michael Cooper, Kurt Rambis, and though he has denied it that he's not interested, look for Jim Herrick. His name is still in the mix there. Now, I also talked with Ike Austin, the, uh, the, the free agent center for the Clippers, and he told me that if the rumors of a possible ownership change are true, that would be a wonderful incentive for him to stay because he says right now he doesn't feel that there's a professional environment there or a commitment to try to win a championship. But with a new ownership shift, that would be the real key element to keeping him around. Well, if it wasn't Ike Austin this year, trade talks swirled around Mitch Richmond. How much longer is that guy going to be a king? You know, he was in Miami for both game one and two, and I've never seen a guy who really looked like with, had, his eyes were just filled with regret because he knew he should have been traded to Miami. He should have been in this series. He says that he knows that he will be traded in the offseason, but he just does not know right now where it will be. But he wants to get out of there very badly, and, and I, can love, I would love to see him with the winning ball club. It okay, should make a difference in this series. Brian, hold tight. We'll check with you one more time a little bit later in the show. Thank you. All right, but for right now, still to come, we will preview Monday's playoff games. That includes the Hawks and Hornets, where Dikembe Mutombo tries to help an Atlanta charge. He certainly has experience from coming back after falling down to love. We'll go there when we come back. Can you identify this face? I demand of them. This is South African academic and activist, Dr. Mampila Rampile. She was born in South Africa's northern province. In 1969, Dr. Rampila co-founded South Africa's Black Consciousness Movement. In 1972, she received a Doctor of Medicine degree at the University of Natal. Five years later, she was banished for her activities in the Black Consciousness Movement. In 1995, she wrote an autobiography. May on TNT Classic Movies. We salute Katherine Hepburn in her birthday month with a great performance every Tuesday, including Adam's Rib and The Philadelphia Story. Mellow out on the bank holiday weekend with a pop-up double bill, a brisky point and blow up. There's an MGM milestone for every Wednesday and on Thursdays an original production from TNT, including Tommy Lee Jones in The Good Old Boys and Christine Larty in Crazy from the Heart. 
That's May on TNT Classic Movies. Every day, CNN International takes the serious spin on the world of sports. Catch all the action from every court and course, track and field. Fiji is the team to watch. From the exotic to the familiar, it's the most comprehensive coverage of competition from across the globe, with up-to-the-minute scores and highlights. Got blazed over the bar. Nil-nil, it stayed. This is the stuff you won't see anywhere else. World Sport, only on CNN International. Programming reminders for you, TNT is the place to be Monday. The Pacers go for the knockout at Cleveland. That will be followed by Game 3 between the Suns and Spurs. That series tied 1-1. Fun begins at 7 Eastern. And a full slate Tuesday, TBS starts things with the Knicks and Heat from the Garden. 8 o'clock TNT, Hornets can eliminate the Hawks. Second half of the night, TBS has the Sonics and T-Wolves. Game 3 there. And TNT closes out the night with the Lakers and Blazers. Los Angeles looking to close out Portland. Action begins again at 7 Eastern. Yeah, forget about your own life. Just watch basketball. <laughs> Joined once again by Brian Burwell. Brian, the Hornets just whacked in the regular season by the Hawks. Four games to none. They've turned it around a big way in the playoffs. What's been the difference thus far? You know what? The main difference, I think, is it has to be um, Anthony Mason. Because now... He is just dominating inside. This is a very big body. He is posting everybody up, and they have nothing, no one who can, who's strong enough to deal with him. This is a guy, Alvin Gentry told me a few uh, weeks ago that this is the only guy he has ever seen who could shove uh, um, uh, um, Shaquille O'Neal out of the post, so that shows you the kind of strength. Now, Dikembe Mutombo played on the Denver team in 94 that came back from an 0-2 deficit to win a series, so he's going to have to give this team some help in showing them a way to try to come back against uh, Charlotte. I don't know if they can do it. All right, Brian Burwell, thanks a lot. We will uh, keep an eye on that game. Uh, Tuesday night, Charlotte at Atlanta. The series goes back to uh, Atlanta and see if the Hawks can try to turn it around. Duncan, who averaged 21 points and 12 rebounds a game, received 113 out of a possible 116 votes. Duncan and former Rookie of the Year David Robinson look to give San Antonio the upper hand in their first round series against Phoenix. And Duncan down low, looking good and looking strong for the Spurs. Second quarter. Duncan on Mark Bryant hits the jumper. Spurs up by six, but the Suns hanging tough. But later it was Vinny Del Negro to Jaron Jackson to put the Spurs up by six, and then more Jaron Jackson. Avery Johnson to Jackson in the corner. He drains the tray. The Spurs roll in this one 188 to take a 2-1 lead. They can wrap up the series Wednesday at home. Pacers against the Cavs. Cavaliers' Brevin Knight running the break. The easy dish to Sean Kemp for the dunk. Cavaliers up by one. Second quarter, Derek Anderson driving the lane, trying to cut the Pacer lead to four, and does. Later in the second quarter, though, the Pacers' Rick Smits, the Dutchman, hitting the sweet turnaround jumper. He finished with 26, the Pacers by two. But late, it is Anderson to Kemp. Game high 31 for him. Cleveland takes it 86 to 77. The Pacers lead the best of five series, however, two games to one.